My name is Kath Rias and I'm the Executive Director of CAS. And the ladies from Alberta Education asked me to start our day with uh, greetings and welcome to all of you. The genesis of these two days came from the CAS Fall Conference in Calgary in November. What happened in the sessions that Alberta Education did about setting the direction at that fall conference that led to action on inclusion the feedback was that people wanted a day like this to help central office people and decision makers to plan for September. So what we've done is kind of a transition here. These two days are for central decision makers to learn about action on inclusion. In March, when we have the learning symposium, it's broadened to include curriculum, uh, accountability, technology, FNMI, and also the things that you see today, but they're structured so that your school-based people can come and participate and learn the same things you are today at their level with co-presenters from the field. Thank you, Kath. Alberta Education and CAS are indeed delighted to welcome you all here for this exciting day of learning and insight. My name is Katrin Owen. I'm very pleased to be with you today as your MC. Today you'll hear us talk about some key concepts that are driving change towards an inclusive education system in Alberta. As you well know, transformation cannot happen without transformative action. And throughout our discussions today, we'll share some of what the Ministry is doing to act on the ambition of action on inclusion. It's our hope that when you leave here today, you'll have at least a clearer understanding of where government is going with this work. You should know more about collaborative practice between school, home and community, the role of learning coaches in building capacity, support for building a culture of inclusion, the value of differentiating instruction and supporting teachers in their work to ensure success in meeting the needs of all students, and also what a more inclusive planning process could look like in jurisdictions. It will, we hope, be a day of insight, a day of information, and hopefully also a day of inspiration. In essence, today is about moving closer to the reality of an inclusive education system as described originally in the Setting the Direction framework and supported by the Government of Alberta's response to that framework, which, as you know, occurred in the summer of 2010. Since then, there has been lots of work underway. But as you well know, making shifts of this magnitude uh, particularly pr the magnitude of the changes proposed by Action in on Inclusion requires an acceptance of change on a broad scale. This is a classic paradigm shift. And to set the tone for such a shift and to put the ambition of this work in context, we'd like to kick off the day with a thought-provoking advocate for educational change, Sir Ken Robinson. His reminder in this short video that we're going to show you is that in order to change successfully, we need to be willing to shed the status quo, and it's a fitting start to our thinking today. Sir Ken. Every country on earth at the moment is reforming public education. There are two reasons for it. The first of them is economic. People are trying to f work out how do we educate our children to take their place in the economies of the 21st century? How do we do that? Given that we can't anticipate what the economy will look like at the end of next week, as the recent turmoil is demonstrating. How do we do that? The second, though, is cultural. Every country on, the earth, on earth is trying to figure out how do we educate our children so they have a sense of cultural identity and so that we can pass on the cultural genes of our communities while being part of the process of globalization. How do we square that circle? The problem is they're trying to meet the future by doing what they did in the past. And on the way, they're alienating millions of kids who don't see any purpose in going to school. When we went to school, we were kept there with a story, which was if you worked hard and did well and got a college degree, you would have a job. Our kids don't believe that. And they're right not to, by the way. You're better having a degree than not, but it's not a guarantee anymore. And particularly not if the route to it 
marginalizes most of the things that you think are important about yourself. Some people say we have to raise standards as if this is a breakthrough. You know, like, really, yes, I, we should. Why would you lower them? You know, I, mean, I, I haven't come across an argument that persuades me of lowering them. But raising them, of course we should raise them. The problem is that the current system of education was designed and conceived and structured for a different age. It was conceived in the intellectual culture of the Enlightenment and in the economic circumstances of the Industrial Revolution. Before the middle of the 19th century, there were no systems of public education. Not really. I mean, you could get educated by Jesuits, you know, if, if you had the money. But public education, paid for from taxation, compulsory to everybody and free at the point of delivery, that was a revolutionary idea. And many people objected to it. They said it's not possible for many street kids, working class children, to benefit from public education. They're incapable of learning to read and write, and why are we spending time on this? So there's also built into it a whole series of um, assumptions about social structure and capacity. It was driven by an economic imperative of the time, but running right through it um, was an intellectual model of the mind, which was essentially the Enlightenment view of intelligence. That real intelligence consists in the capacity for a certain type of deductive reasoning and a knowledge of the classics originally, what we come to think of as academic ability. And this is deep in the gene pool of public education, that there are really two types of people, academic and non-academic, smart people and non-smart people. And the consequence of that is that many brilliant people think they're not, because they've been judged against this particular view of the mind. So we have twin pillars, economic and intellectual. And my view is that this model has caused chaos in many people's lives. It's been great for some. There have been people who have benefited wonderfully from it. But most people have not. Instead, they suffer this. This is the modern epidemic, and it's as misplaced, and it's as fictitious. This is the plague of ADHD. Now, this is a map of the instance of ADHD in America, or prescriptions for ADHD. Don't mistake me here. I don't mean to say there is no such thing as attention deficit disorder. I'm not qualified to say if there is such a thing. I know that a great majority of psychologists and, and pediatricians think there is such a thing. But it's still a matter of, dis of debate. What I do know for a fact is it's not an epidemic. These kids are being medicated as routinely as we had our tonsils taken out. And on the same whimsical basis and for the same reason, medical fashion. Our children are living in the most intensely stimulating period in the history of the earth. They're being besieged with information and calls for their attention from every platform, computers, from iPhones, from advertising holdings, from hundreds of television channels. And we're penalizing them now for getting distracted. From what? You know, boring stuff <laughs> at school, for the most part. It seems to me it's not a coincidence totally that the incidence of ADHD has risen in parallel with the growth of standardized testing. Now, these kids are being given Ritalin and Adderall and all manner of things, often quite dangerous drugs, to get them focused and calm them down. But according to this, attention deficit disorder increases as you travel east across the country. People start losing interest in Oklahoma. <laughs> They can hardly think straight in Arkansas. And by the time they get to Washington, they've lost it completely. And there are separate reasons for that, I believe. <laughs> it's a fictitious epidemic. If you think of it, the arts, and I don't say this exclusively the arts, I think it's also true of science and of maths, but let me, I say about the arts particularly because they are the victims of this mentality currently, particularly. The arts especially address the idea of aesthetic experience. An aesthetic experience is one in which your senses are operating at their peak. When you're present in the current moment, when you're resonating with the excitement of this thing that you're experiencing, when you are fully alive. An anesthetic is when you shut your senses off and deaden yourself to what's happening. And a lot of these drugs are that. We're getting our children to education by anesthetizing them. 
And I think we should be doing the exact opposite. We shouldn't be putting them asleep. We should be waking them up to what they have inside of themselves. But the model we have is this. It's, I believe we have a system of education that is modeled on the interests of industrialism and in the image of it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, schools are still pretty much organized on factory lines, so ringing bells, separate facilities, uh, specialized into separate subjects. Um, we still educate children by batches. You know, we put them through the system by age group. Why do we do that? You know, why is there this assumption that the most important thing kids have in common is how old they are? You know, it's like the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. You know what I mean? Well, I know kids who are much better than other kids at the same age in different disciplines. You know, or at different times of the day. Or better in smaller groups than in large groups. Or sometimes they want to be on their own. If you're interested in the model of learning, you don't start from this production line mentality. These are, it's essentially about conformity and increasingly it's about that as you look at the growth of standardized testing and standardized curricula. And it's about standardization. I believe we've got to go in the exact opposite direction. That's what I mean about changing the paradigm. There was a great study done recently of divergent thinking. It was published a couple of years ago. Divergent thinking isn't the same thing as creativity. I define creativity as the, the process of having original ideas that have value. Divergent thinking isn't a synonym, but it's a, an essential capacity for creativity. It's the ability to see lots of possible answers to a question, lots of possible ways of interpreting a question, uh, to think what Edward de Bono would probably call laterally, uh, to think not just in linear or convergent ways, uh, to see multiple answers, not one. So, I mean, there are tests for this. I mean, one kind of cod example would be people might be asked to say, how many uses can you think of for a paperclip? One of those routine questions. Most people might come up with 10 or 15. People who are good at this might come up with 200. And they do that by saying, well, could the paperclip be 200 foot tall and be made out of foam rubber? You know, like, does it have to be a paperclip as we know it, Jim? You know. Um, now, there are tests for this. And they gave them to 1,500 people. This is in a book called Breakpoint and Beyond. And on the protocol of the test, if you scored above a certain level, you'd be considered to be a genius at divergent thinking. Okay? So my question to you is, what percentage of the people tested, of the 1,500, scored at genius level for divergent thinking? Now, you need to know one more thing about them. These were kindergarten children. So what do you think? What percentage at genius level? 80. 80, okay. 98%. Now, the thing about this was it was a longitudinal study. So they retested the same children five years later, aged of eight to ten. What do you think? Fifty? They retested them again five years later, ages uh, 13 to 15. You can see a trend here, can't you? <laughs> now, this tells an interesting story because you could have imagined it going the other way, couldn't you? You start off not being very good, but you get better as you get older. But this shows two things. One is, we all have this capacity. And two, it mostly deteriorates. Now, a lot of things have happened to these kids as they've grown up. A lot. But one of the most important things that happened to them, I'm convinced, is that by now, they've become educated. They, you know, they've spent 10 years at school being told there's one answer, it's at the back. And don't look. And don't copy, because that's cheating. I mean, outside schools, that's called collaboration. You know, but <laughs> inside schools. Now, this isn't because teachers want it this way. It's just because it happens that way. Um, it's because it's in the gene pool of education. We have to think differently about human capacity. We have to get over this old conception of academic, non-academic, abstract, theoretical, vocational, uh, and see it for what it is, um, a myth, uh, secondly, we have to recognize that most great learning happens in groups, that collaboration is the stuff of growth. If we atomize people and separate them and judge them separately, we form a kind of disjunction between them and their natural learning environment. And thirdly, it's crucially about the culture of our institutions, the habits of the institution and the habitats that they occupy. I want to just touch on a few issues that I know have been on your minds uh, over the last few months. We've heard concerns about inclusive education. Those concerns have been raised 
uh, in part by system leaders such as yourselves. We know you get questions from colleagues, from classroom teachers, from principals, from trustees, parents, and other stakeholders. We've heard you request information on coding and whether it will exist in September. We've heard you say that funding decisions need to be made in order to help you with planning. We've heard you say that you have concerns about the potential replacement of IPPs and how parents view these plans as an accountability mechanism that's important. We've received questions about Rex, SHIP and CYCN and where these service delivery models fit into the future of action on inclusion. And we know that these programs need to make staffing decisions and are waiting for leadership from government. We've also had questions about PUF and how early interventions fit into an inclusive model. You've asked what's the viability of these programs in the fall. And perhaps the most prevalent question from you has been on funding and the fact that there has to date been a lack of a clear plan for September 2011 that has been communicated to jurisdictions and that understandably is a source of frustration. I can tell you that the leadership of education, children and youth services, and health and wellness departments have been working together to develop this transition towards an inclusive education system that will be managed gradually. Creating an inclusive education system means working with school authorities to ensure all students are successful. And it requires, as Sir Ken said, changes to our thinking and to our action in terms of both government policy and educational practice. And the government's commitment is that it will support stakeholders and service providers as action on inclusion is implemented over the next few years. And it will build a clear coherence between government policy and school jurisdiction practice. It's important that we underscore through our discussions today that the government of Alberta has no desire to reduce funding to support students with diverse learning needs. It continues to provide funding to school boards to support the education of all students who have special education needs. So let me drill down into a few of these issues and give you some insight into what the thinking has been thus far. On coding, the department knows that data collection will always be an important part of understanding the student population that we serve. And we'll always need to know who is in classrooms of the day. However, coding as it currently exists, we've heard repeatedly, is a poor way of addressing student need. It, doesn't lead to f it does not lead to funding to support programming services for students, but focuses instead on funding to support student deficits. And on the subject of IPPs, with the piloting of the inclusive education planning tool that you'll be hearing more about today, there have been some concerns expressed by parents that the IPP, if the IPP is replaced, they will lose the document that they believe provides assurances to them that services will be provided to their child. And we understand this sentiment. What's important to bear in mind is that the planning process embedded in the inclusive education planning tool incorporates most of the elements of the traditional IPP. The one difference is that goals are replaced with supports and strategies for learning. And this planning tool and process recognize, recognizes and values parental input. Piloting of the inclusive education planning process focuses on building teacher capacity and enhancing teacher practice to better meet the diverse needs of all students. On the topic of funding, we are all going to need to be waiting until budget 2011 to see if there is additional funding available to support the implementation of action on inclusion. And while this topic is, as you well know, a high priority for the minister and for this department, all innovations will need to be balanced with the current provincial fiscal realities. On service delivery, we know that collaboration is key to good service delivery. SHIP, Rex, and CUICN are all sound examples of teamwork and collaboration. But this collaboration is not yet system-wide. It exists in pockets across the province, and the downside of such projects is that they run the risk of reinforcing separateness and silos. Still, 
there is lots to be learned from the processes that some of these individual service delivery models have used and Alberta Education is committed to learning from each of those and embedding the collaborative practice throughout the system. Currently work is underway to examine the individual service delivery models and determine what pieces can be applied to a provincial approach that ensures that a continuum of supports and services is available across education, health and wellness and children and youth services. This continuum must be based on the hierarchy of interventions, universal, targeted and specialized, that articulates the supports and services available across all three ministries. And let's talk about the early years. You've been clear, as have parents, that the transition between early in intervention programs and grade one is an important component of the inclusive education system. The early learning branch held a promising practices symposium in early January. Some of you may have been there, and it was very successful. Its key learnings were that the attitude of childcare professionals and early childhood teachers is pivotal to success, and that if we build inclusive preschool and kindergarten classes, all students become themselves ambassadors for inclusion, and it becomes ever more natural as the years advance. Youngsters find the paradigm shift easy, and in some respects, they become our teachers on how to be inclusive. I've just touched on a few of the issues that you have wanted further information on and today's sessions will hopefully shed light on the direction that this work is taking. Today is also important because it underscores a new way of working together in a consultative and collaborative way. I know that's not cheating. As we contemplate transformation on the scale that's being imagined, it wouldn't be appropriate for government to simply say, here's how it's going to be. We all know that top-down is problematic and that the best thinking and the best problem-solving happens when we do it together, side